this afternoon we have a special treat of hearing from one of our own. A great reminder of who we see in the hallways offer a wealth of knowledge for us. Um, I've had the, the honor of learning from, working for, and even traveling with Professor Daniela Hirschfeld. She has been a draw to and an inspiration within the program for me. She is an assistant professor here at Utah State University in the LAP department with her expertise in spatial planning um, for long-term climate change impacts and the building of resilient systems. Her research focuses on projecting the costs of adaptation options, unpacking the implications of science and practice um, interactions, and understanding the adaptive capacity of governance systems. She is particularly interested in weaving together the connected disciplines of urban ecology and environmental planning to bridge between theory and planning practice. Daniela received her PhD in landscape architecture and environmental planning from the University of California, Berkeley. She also holds a bachelor's degree in psychology and philosophy from Dartmouth College and a master's degree in environmental management from Duke University's Nicholas School of Environment. From Jordan to Tel Aviv to San Francisco to Utah State, Daniela has impressed ambitious drive for climate adaptation across the world. And I can't wait to hear about her research efforts in creating a global community apt for our changing climates. So please, let's uh, welcome Professor Daniela Hirschfeld. Is this working? Excellent. Well, thank you so much for that really warm introduction. And it's amazing to be here. It's amazing that you're all here, given the beautiful snow outside. I know cross-country skiing and the mountains are a total draw. But it's really a pleasure to have everybody here. Um, I'm going to talk today about uncharted waters, creating climate capacity. And before I talk about that, I want to give a little bit more background about some personal things about me and the context that those personal things bring to my research. So first of all, I am a nature lover. Probably everyone in this room is, but these are just a few of the places that the landscapes that have inspired me over the years. We have the Drysdale River, where I spent 42 days canoeing. So for those who didn't know that, that's one place that I once called home. Um, these are the mountains around here. So you know, I love the mountains and beautiful places like that. And then I also grew up spending my summers on the coast out in Long Island. So really find all of these places incredibly grounding and incredibly meaningful. At the same time, I am definitely a city girl. Um, I grew up in New York City. You can actually see that building right there is my high school. Um, I spent five years working in Boston and living in the city, working for the Coastal Zone Management Agency, as well as Star Communities and Ickley Local Governments for Sustainability, supporting planners was really where I got a start of saying, these are planners and I want to support them to do this really important work. Um, and then I also lived in San Francisco for six years. So I am both of these things and I work very hard to weave them together. I am a planner. Um, that means a lot of different things and these are just a few of them for me. But you guys can see up there my calendar, that's my personal way of planning every day and every minute of all of the things that I have to juggle. Um, I'm also a spatial planner. This is some of my early research looking at where would we put a shoreline if we were gonna protect it from sea level rise. And then I'm a planner in that I wanna hear from everybody. This is not just about me, but it is about the collective and that planning for me is really about all of that. I'm also an educator. Um, you heard about going traveling, so I spent time with some of you in Israel and that was really important. Um, I, this is a class that I used to teach at Berkeley where we would get out into the river and we would measure uh, Strawberry Creek. And then these are my children. And really, when I think about education, I'm thinking about the future. I'm thinking about all of you, I'm thinking about all of us. And that really inspires my work to think about climate change. So we're talking about uncharted waters. What do I mean by that? Well, we are in a completely unprecedented time. Greenhouse gases have never been this high in the last several million years. So it's a really profound moment in time that we are packed, baked into a certain amount of change. And we have to design and plan for that future. And we don't know exactly what that future looks like. 
But one of the things that we can do is we can create and build capacity to address that. So I'm going to talk to you about work from my lab. And I want to acknowledge that this is not just work that I've done, but as Addison referenced, many of the students in this room and many students more globally, as well as my colleagues, have really contributed to this. So this is from the Resilience Hub Lab. And I'm going to provide a little bit more specific context. And then I will talk about two different projects, one being a global survey and one being a global series of workshops, and present some conclusions from this work. So what is the context that I'm talking about? I am talking about coastal hazards and risk. Does anyone know where this is? Any guesses? I heard somebody say New Orleans over there. Someone back there said New Orleans. Any other guesses? Did I hear Puerto Rico? Maybe? OK, well, this is Puerto Rico. Um, and this is just one example. This is not to say this is the only place. This is Puerto Rico after Hurricane Fiona, which was the worst flooding since Hurricane Maria happened in 2017. So um, this is happening all over the world more and more. And it is a huge problem. It left um, most a third of the territory without water. And 25 people were killed in this one incident. So these are really, really big impacts. And this is today. But this is the future. The seas are rising. Raise your hand if you've seen a graph that looks like this. OK, so most people have seen this graph. This is not news. I think the thing that's most important about this for us all to keep in mind is, first of all, we have this next 20 years. Pretty much these two lines are exactly the same. So the red line is we go on a high emissions scenario. We emit greenhouse gases. And the blue line is we try and taper that back. But in either case, the next 20 years, 30 years, are almost exactly the same sea level rise scenario, which means that we need to be preparing for at least that amount of change. The other thing that we see in this graph, though, is there's a pretty profound difference. We're talking about maybe half a million out into the future. So our choices today matter in terms of what future we're living in. And as planners, we have to plan for both of these trajectories. We can't plan for the, we know it's going to be blue. And we can't plan for, we know it's Red, we don't know which one of these things it's going to be. And there's a really wide range on them. This is not just one number out into the future. So these are some of the challenges. We also know this is happening all over the world. These are headlines from last year. And what we're seeing here is you know, alarming sea level rise in the UK, extreme storm surges, Mumbai and India. African heritage sites are threatened by coastal flooding. And protect or retreat, rising seas threaten Canada's Atlantic and Pacific coast. So this is a global phenomenon. And the research that I'm interested in is at this global scale. We also have to remember, coasts are a very dynamic place. So when we're thinking about sea level rise, we're thinking about many different things here. It's not just the coast, not just the sea level itself. We have to think about the rainfall event. How much rain is coming at the same time as that storm surge? What's happening with the river? Maybe it's not raining here. Maybe the snow melt is happening over there. The river is coming down and colliding with that sea level rise amount. And then this is a really important piece, the groundwater. The groundwater is going to get higher as the seas rise. Another research project of mine come back in two years, and I'll tell you more about that. But really important thing to keep in mind, these dynamic coasts. And then we also have to keep in mind, this is a really important place of habitat. So we have really profound implications from this. This is uh, my colleague, Patlako Chati, in South Africa. And he's presenting the, the confounding and problems that they're experiencing there. Coastal erosion, storm tides, infrastructure damage, and inundation. We also have these profound implications. This is a video that colleagues of mine made from the Philippines. 
in Tubigon. Um, and then this is another project in Carnassus, New York. These are people who think they could be climate refugees. We don't know, they haven't been made to move yet, but these are people starting to recognize that they may need to move because their homes will no longer be habitable. Um, this is just another way of looking at these profound implications. Um, current projections suggest that 180 million people are directly at risk in sea level rise, and over 1 billion people are living in low level coastal elevations. Um, this is from a study here in the United States looking at where they all might go. So kind of interesting to think about where are people going, all this migration. One thing that's really interesting about this study is that here in Utah, there's actually no major projected change. So stay here, <laughs> maybe, who really knows for sure, but um, just sort of interesting way to think about that, that these profound implications are about infrastructure and people and their livelihoods. So what does all that mean? That's a lot of information. What do we do with that? When I think about these questions, I am really interested in thinking about how would somebody whose job it is to be a planner, to be a designer, to be an engineer and figure out what height is that seawall going to be, what information does that person need? How can they use that information? Is it usable at all? So what is, I mean, that's sort of a rather abstract. So just give a few examples. These are very specific decisions that places are grappling with. This is from a project in Cambridge, Massachusetts. And they're doing a study to look at which social assets would be protected, which economic assets should be protected, and which watersheds should be the focus of their work. So this is something a planner is trying to figure out. Um, which biotech companies are the ones in the, um, this funny little green sign here? Um, and which natural red, national registry historic places? So trying to figure out and understand what kinds of protections should happen. These are the types of decisions that are being grappled with. This is another project that was part of this big study in Vancouver where they're trying to figure out, should they protect, protect natural ecosystems? So um, what you're seeing here is these, the current situation with low and high tide. And then in 2050, you basically have a smaller range of low and high tide. And by 2100, you have an even smaller range. You can see that right here. And that range of high tide means a loss of that ecosystem, unless we do something as a planner to make a different decision. So the question is, should we protect those natural ecosystems? How do we protect them? One option would be to think about what's behind them. You don't see it in this image, but behind this is homes. Let's say we get rid of those homes, and then that natural ecosystem can naturally migrate backwards. That's what a wetland would do had we not built homes behind it. That's one option. Another option would be to say, let's restore it. You could actually go and put sediment on top of those ecosystems in a specific process and a specific manner, and that would be another way to protect these. So thinking about those decisions are the types of things that all of this research and this quandary and this capacity building is about. And then we also have design decisions. These are different design options. Um, this is from the IPCC of saying, what could we put or how would we design these places? What design interventions do we use? Maybe we have a no response situation. We just see what happens, let it play out. Maybe we build a seawall. That would be a design strategy. Maybe we accommodate sea level rise. We learn to live with it by building higher. So now we have homes that when the high tide comes in can get flooded. Or we have something called advance. So rather than retreating and moving back, we actually build things out in front and that provides protection for the things behind them. Then we have this idea that retreat, so you take the home and you move it back. And then we have something called ecosystem-based adaptation. This would be a way of saying, let's put wetlands in front of those homes to be the form of protection. Or let's put a mangrove out there to be that form of protection. 
So these are all examples of decisions that need to be made around design and planning that people are thinking about right now. So one of the things that we can do, rather than focusing on any one of those decisions, is can we build the capacity for all different people whose job it is to deal with these types of decisions? What do I mean by capacity? Well, there's many ways to think about it, but I define capacity as the characteristic of institutions that empower actors to design and plan for responses to the impacts of climate change. For example, if the city of San Francisco had 20 staff people, and the city of New York only had one staff person working on this topic, San Francisco would have a greater capacity. So we're really thinking about, can we build that capacity? One way to build it is by adding staff people. Another way would be to be adding resources, right? So you could put money towards that problem, or you could make connections that would become a resource. So there's a number of ways to measure capacity. This is a previous paper of mine. Um, but I was looking at institutional capacity and then adopted actions. Did they have already in place a seawall? That would be an adopted action. Or did they have a specific hazard mitigation plan? So there's a number of specific actions that they could be taking. What is the quality of the research that they have in place? Is there collaboration regionally? And then what planning processes are, there, are they using? So this idea of building capacity is really about can we support all of these decision makers at all of these different scales to do this really important work? So my questions are, are there spatial patterns in the use of sea level rise science in decision making? So this is coming to these specific projects to try and understand where capacity is at and can we build it? Do we observe a standardized or non-standardized approach to using sea level rise projections globally? And then the big question, can we build capacity amongst planners, coastal managers, designers, through our process itself? So through the process of these two projects that I'm going to talk about, can we actually build this capacity? So project one is a global survey that I conducted. Um, and when I say global, you can see here truly the global nature of this project. Um, we have representation on every single continent. And we didn't have a single continent that had more than 50% of the responses. So we really did reach out globally. Um, in total, we got 667 people to at least partially respond or interact with us. Um, and in the end, we had almost 40%, 38%, who fully completed the survey. Um, you might ask, how on earth did we actually reach that global group? So we can start with the fact that we use what's called the snowball sampling approach. And I started with 21 collaborators all across the globe. So pretty much in every single location that we had at least one, if not multiple, collaborators on various continents. And they identified contacts that we should reach out to. And then snowball sampling means that those people then provided more people for us to speak to. And you see how that could grow into a snowball sample. Um, we also made this available in nine different languages. So we had Arabic, Chinese, English, Hebrew, Japanese, Korean, Portuguese, and Spanish. And we had this all professionally translated. Um, we actually tried having our collaborators translate it, and that was a total disaster. It turns out that collaborators might think they're multilingual, but you really need a professional set to do this. So it was really helpful to be able to get that done, and then have our collaborators check a few of the more technical terms. Um, I'm going to go back because it's not showing that. But So then what we did is we sent an email to everybody on our list, all of those snowball sampled individuals, and then we got our responses back. And what did we find from all of this? The first thing that we found is that almost all of the people that we surveyed are doing something about sea level rise. When I say almost all, 72% said, we have already adopted something. We are doing this work. We have 
a policy in place. We have um, materials, reports, documents. We are doing sea level rise planning in our jurisdiction. The next 26% you see over here, these people all said, we're not officially doing anything, but we've held meetings. We are trying to do something. And then our final 2% said, no, we're just, we're, we are not there at all for whatever set of reasons. So I think this is a really, really amazing number to think about that um, people are doing this. This idea of planning for sea level rise is happening at the global scale. Um, we're talking about populations, millions of people live in these locations. So this represents a really important sample and really important when we think back to those profound implications, right? Those people who are living there have planners who are trying to make sure that their long-term future is as safe and as healthy and as livable as possible. The other thing that we found is where on earth is this happening? So I think it's really interesting to see um, here in the North America, we've got a really high rate of people saying yes. Over 75% of respondents in North America said yes. On the other hand, the Caribbean, where Puerto Rico is not exactly in the Caribbean from that previous image, but that same general location, and less than 25, or yeah, less than 25% of the Caribbean is working on this. So we have a pretty stark dichotomy if we were to look at just those two regions. Um, then we also have really high responses in Australia and New Zealand and in Northern Europe. We find a really interesting dichotomy between Northern Europe, a lot of work going on in that, and then if we go to the Mediterranean, Southern Europe and Northern Africa, very little work happening there. Um, this could very well be because there's less risk in those locations, or it could be that there are less resources and capacity in those locations. And we don't actually know where, which reason and why yet, but that's an, another area of inquiry. Um, the other thing that I will highlight here is you'll see that we didn't get responses from every single country. Right? So there's still parts of the globe that we don't know what is happening. But we do know that of our sample, there's a really amazing amount of work in this area. So what are some of our other findings? Well, one of the things we wanted to know is when you say you're doing this kind of planning, how are you going about it? What numbers are you using? And the first part of that is, are you using more than one number? Right? If you remember back to the blue and red lines, there isn't just one number out in the future. There's lots of different numbers. And so we're curious to know, were people planning for a single number? As you can see here in the orange. Were they planning for a low and a high? You could make those the equivalent of a blue line and a red line. Were they planning for a low, median, and high? Were they planning for a low, median, high, and upper? So we were trying to figure out how did they structure these. And one of the things that we see that's really interesting is that 53% of the globe is only planning for one number out into the future. But there isn't just one number out into the future. So it's a really stark dichotomy from what the science shows us and what we know about the future and what respondents are telling us. The other thing that we find from this is what actual numbers are they using? And I'm not going to bore you with every detail of this, but the thing that we're seeing that's most interesting, so this is those back to this is the singular, low, high, all of those scenarios. And then these are the median number and the range within those places. And then over here, we have what the science in the sea level rise reports are telling us would in theory be used at, by those places. And so what I find most interesting and confounding about this research is that the numbers that people are using are way outside of the range of the scientific information. So you might be scratching your head and thinking, why on earth is that happening? Right? Why would planners in New Zealand be using a number that the science isn't suggesting is the appropriate number or that isn't the one that uh, um, you know, isn't the projection. What are they doing that would make them use a higher number? 
And our current theory, and we have to dig more into, and I'll get to sort of our next steps, but current theory is that they might be using additional information. So they might have, rather than telling us just this sea level rise number, they might be in fact telling us the sea level rise number and the storm surge and things related to groundwater and things related to rain events. So there may be multiple things in here. We tried to get them to tell us most accurately, but there may be something that was with our survey design that's going on in here. It may also be that they're doing the best job to make the right decisions for their place. It may be that the science is projecting this, but they want to be more risk averse. They want to protect their citizens, and so they're going to use a higher projection out into the future. Um, that is an area of open inquiry that we're going to continue to pursue. Um, the final thing from this research that we're trying to figure out and think about is they did in fact tell us what they were using it for. Um, and they're using it for all kinds of different things. What context do you apply these future sea levels? One of it is to adopt new policies, to plan for adaptation, to frame vulnerability, to create hazard assessments, to implement adaptation, and for building an infrastructure. So this really complicated graphic, which looks really complicated, but isn't really all that complicated, I should say, is essentially telling you that way, the vast majority, um, it's not in percentage, but let's say 80% are using their sea level rise numbers for absolutely everything. And then there's a whole bunch of people who are using it for some weird combination of things that we will need to read their plans to further understand what this combination is. But essentially, we've got almost everybody who's using their numbers for almost everything. So it's really hard to get a lot more insight from that, but it is helpful to realize that there's a lot going on, um, and there's a lot of this work happening around the globe. So as I said, I'm going to present on two projects. And so this is the second project. This was a <coughs> practitioner-led workshop to advance resilience to sea level rise. So this, when I say practitioner, these are back to, we had, um, we had planners from all over the world, we had designers, we had engineers, we had scientists, we had a very wide array of people who identify as a practitioner. And then when I say led, I think this is really important. What I mean is they helped design this. So rather than me sitting here in Utah, or a sea level rise scientist sitting in the UK saying, this is what we need to be doing. We surveyed those who wanted to participate and asked them what they would get out of it and how could we build capacity for them through a series of workshops. So we again reached out across our globe and we got 26% from North America, 3% for South America, 11% from Africa, 13% from Europe, 22 from Asia, and 25 from Oceania, um, mostly Australia and New Zealand, although we also had Singapore and a few other um, places in the South Pacific there. So really brought all these people together, and you could imagine that we brought them all together in person, but we actually brought them together over Zoom. Um, this was in February of 2022, and I'd say Zoom for all of its terrible failings and all of its flaws, was really an amazing opportunity to get this whole global group together and have them be able to talk to one another and learn from one another and for us to learn from them, really to hear what is happening in their places, what do they need, how could we build capacity for them. So um, it was a three-day workshop, two hours each day. We had a basically welcome session, um, participant introductions, then we had lightning talks. So we tried to keep the lightning talks really, really short, um, just get a little bit of seeds flowing, short ideas, and then the really bulk of this was breakout groups. So you guys all sitting in the room, you know what it feels like after a certain number of minutes of someone speaking at you, and you're going, I want to say something, or I want to engage, or I want to connect, and especially on Zoom, right? So what we really did is focus on Let's get everyone being able to say things. Um, and so we had a bunch of breakout rooms. There were about five to seven people in each breakout room. 
Every one of them had both a facilitator and a rapporteur. And then we had these Miro boards. I'm sure you all have used a version of Miro boards where you can put little sticky notes and you can draw things. And um, it's like, can, was it Canvas? Not Canvas. There's another one that we used. Board. Concept board. Thank you. Yes, exactly. Concept board. So we've all used various tools like this. Um, and then we had synthesis sessions and open networking. So it really was meant to be a very engaged set of workshops. And um, three different days. The first day was really focused on the science. As you can tell, I'm really interested in what science is being used and how is that getting translated. Um, the second day was focused on planning. And then the third day was about communications. This is a really important one. Um, when we originally sat around in that room, um, and I say we, there was a whole committee of us that planned this. All, Half academics and half practitioners were on the planning committee. But when we sent out that survey to everyone who was coming to attend, they said, we are, we are the front lines of communication. Our job of communication is to the public. We need to communicate to our elected officials. We need to communicate to the newspapers. We are doing communication, and we need a whole day of time to talk about how we do this communication. So this idea of co-designing really helped us to make sure that we had that day to build that capacity for them. Um, these are a few examples of our lightning talk speakers. We have um, Lau Romero from the Philippines, Noel Mandana from the Philippines, and then Adam Paris from New York. These were just a few of the people who planted a few seeds to help the conversation get going. Like I said, we had a bunch of interactive breakout groups, um, and there were a bunch of sticky notes that got posted from them. So you can see a few of them here. Um, the question of what's really important, okay, collaboration between local coastal councils. Local histories and experiences enable multi-stakeholder planning for climate change. Starting to look at sea level rise more holistically. So these are a bunch of different sticky notes that people gave us to help us understand what they need and what's going on in their communities. So one example of what we did with all of this is we synthesized all of that information. There is a massive report. Um, a few of you have been assigned or have had a chance to look at it. And it's really a phenomenal final product from this. Um, but one of the things that we found that I thought was really, really interesting is what is the most important information about sea level rise that you need to make decisions? And what we found is that what people really need 50% of our sticky notes, people need near-term information. They don't actually need information right now, necessarily, about 100 years from now. They really, really need more local information. And then they need it locally. So they need near-term and local information. <coughs> they don't need another IPCC report that tells them what, you know, it's going to be two centimeters more or two centimeters less. They don't need that. They need what things are going to happen here in these locations. How can I possibly design for sea level rise if I don't really understand what's going to happen in Cambridge? So they need this really local information. Ultimately, they, this whole group and this whole exercise led to a series of recommendations. Um, these are the recommendations that were written up for science. So the first science recommendation is to model compound interactions. You may remember at the beginning I was explaining this idea that it's not just sea level rise, but it's rain and river and groundwater. There are not yet good models that capture those interactions. And people really need those in order to make those informed decisions. So that was something that was really big that we learned not that we didn't necessarily know, but it helped to reinforce that understanding of how important that is. Um, generating localized data, creating timelines. That was something that really, really resonated with me. You might remember my calendar, right? People want to know when this is going to happen. Is it gonna happen in 10 years? Is it gonna happen in 15 years? They need to understand these timelines because they need to be able to make decisions in advance of these things happening. Bridge doesn't get built overnight. A wetland doesn't get restored overnight. A seawall doesn't get built overnight. 
right? So they need to understand the timelines in order to integrate that into their designs, their process, their plans. Address uncertainty and probabilities. So there's that wi really wide range and planners, decision makers, they need that wide range to be narrowed as much as possible and they need clarity around how likely certain scenarios and certain futures are. And then they really want to build consistency in reports. So these were some of our science specific findings. And we also had a bunch of planning recommendations that came out of this. The first one was to embed equity. Would anyone have thought that that would be the first planning recommendation to come out of this? I have to admit, I was surprised. I didn't think that that was going to be the thing that was going to rise to the top. Um, and yet, it shouldn't be totally shocking. If you think back to those very first images, who it is that may be suffering from this, there's a deep recognition amongst the planning community that that equity question is really, really at the forefront and that we really need to be making sure that that is of the utmost importance, that we are not just building seawalls for wealthy homeowners and abandoning other places, but that we need to make sure that we're thinking about that equity question throughout the whole process. And then next up is engage stakeholders. Really resonates with embedding equity. If we're going to embed equity, we need to hear from all of the constituents, right? Those sticky notes, it's not just hearing from one group, but we really need to hear from everybody. So engaging those stakeholders is so critical and so important. And then build capacity. So this building capacity could be applied to the global scale where we need to build capacity in the Philippines, more so than we might need to build capacity in San Francisco. And then we also need to build capacity within the city of San Francisco so that the citizens in certain neighborhoods don't suffer because they have the capacity or the resources to navigate this adaptation challenge. Use innovative approaches. So there's a planning tool called um, Dynamic Adaptation Planning Pathways and people are really excited about it. There's actually a workshop that came out of this workshop happening this week. There's 200 people across the globe signed up to learn how to use these innovative planning approaches. So this is something that really came out and really resonated. Um, and then design with flexibility. What does that mean, design with flexibility? Designing with flexibility, which may be simply, simpler said than actually done, means design in such a way that things can change over time. Rather than putting in a static seawall that has to get elevated all the time, can you put something in there that can be moved or in a way that we can migrate over time. So there's flexibility built into the designs so that they can adapt as the seas rise. So they're going to continue to rise with an uncertain amount into the future, but they are going to continue to arise. So those are all of the planning recommendations. You might remember, we started out with this question, can we build capacity? So this is just one big graph that's very purple that says, in our particular example, the answer was absolutely yes. So we surveyed all of the people who participated in our workshops, and 74% said, absolutely. And then the other 26% said, a little bit. So they didn't say they weren't. There was nobody who said, it was a scale of one to five. So there was nobody on the low end of the scale. And basically the answer was, through this process, we can build capacity amongst coastal managers, amongst planners, amongst designers to deal with this challenge of climate adaptation. So I'm going to kind of end with what do we do next? Where do we go from here with all of this? One of the things that I see moving forward is that we build a community of practice. Um, this also actually came directly out of the survey and the workshops was what we want to do is be able to get together more. We want to connect. We want to be part of a global community of people who are dealing with this challenge. So that was a really important thing that we heard from them. And this will bolster further capacity. If everyone who participated in this workshop felt like their capacity grew, being part of a community of practice will also help further and bolster that, bolster capacity. Reach more parts of the globe. 
Um, you know, I think that this is definitely a really global effort, but there were whole swaths of the map that were empty. Um, there are vast places. The answer in those places could be no, we're not dealing with sea level rise, or yes, and we have this amazing innovation and we just don't know about it yet. We haven't heard about it. Um, so that's a really big thing that I think can really um, further inform and further, uh, further help support that community of practice and help people learn from each other. Decolonize climate services. This was something that really came out of the workshops. Over and over we heard um, the thing that does not work for us is when some really famous climate scientist, sea level rise person shows up in our community and says, hey, here's the map. We solved it for you, we have the answer, and then disappears. That does not actually help local governments, that doesn't actually help planners, it doesn't actually help people move forward because they don't understand some of the specifics in the map. Or maybe the person who made the map didn't consider something that was really important locally that needed to be known. So in order to really build capacity, we need to make sure that those scientists and those experts, when they come and they arrive, they engage, they co-produce and co-develop information that is really local and really informative. Um, and then one other thing, and this is much more I'd say in the research end, but I think planned content analysis and qualitative data collection will help us gain deeper insight into specific places, their needs, and ways, ways to support local work. So this is something else that I see. Um, I already have some projects going on in that realm, and I think it's really interesting to dive in more deeply. And with that, I know I said at the beginning, I'm not going to name every single person, but these are a wealth of the names that were involved in the first project. Um, these are all of our workshop participants. These are our workshop organizers. These were the facilitators and rapporteurs. So I want to acknowledge that this was really a collaborative effort. Um, and with that, I'll say thank you all for listening. Yes, questions. This is just for the recording, so you have to speak up. Okay, so um, you mentioned a couple really interesting things that I think have been one of my qualms with how we approach landscape architecture. And um, that's when you were doing your studies, there was a no response situation. I think it is our uh, nature to immediately stop all these natural uh, cycles and happenings and, and protect the human race at, <laughs> at all costs. Um, and then later when you were talking about building with flexibility as a, a quality that some people wanted to implement into planning, how do you, as a researcher, go about um, deciding, I guess, what is important? And like, um, if it's worth just letting these kind of things happen, and then how do you think that we could implement those kind of ideologies into a society that really just wants to go for the long-term easiest answer? <laughs> no, I think that there's a few interesting things in your question there, right? So um, one question that you had is, how do I as a researcher decide that? And I think the simple answer to that is, I as a researcher don't decide that. Um, I, as a researcher, try to understand those who do have to decide that. So the people who make the decision of, um, do we protect a certain, do, do we protect, you know, do we try and stop hazard events from happening? Um, which, by the way, you can't stop a hazard from happening, right? So what you're really meaning is, can we stop the storm surge from damaging homes? Can we build something to say that storm surge stays over here and our human-built infrastructure is protected? Um, and that isn't for me to decide. Um, that is for society to decide. That is for planners to decide. That's for a lot of other people to decide. I can participate in that. Um, so that's, I think, part of your question. Um, another part of your question is, as I understand it, is 
there's a philosophical question of whether or not we should be protecting places or maybe letting them return to their to return to an alternative return I wouldn't say to their original nature because they're if a place has been altered, they aren't at their original nature. Um, and I think that the philosophical question is some places will in fact be returned to the sea. Some places will in fact be returned to the river. Some places will not remain in like human settlement form. And we that's part of the adaptation exercise is trying to figure out where those places are and how we should adopt certain philosophies around that. Um, and there's just so much more to say about it, but it is, it's a really interesting and big challenge. One other thing I'll say is that there was um, a pretty big dichotomy between uh, the workshop B, where we had a lot of people from New Zealand and from the Philippines and from Southeast Asia, where um, there was a lot more traditional local knowledge um, and a much more um, connected philosophy with nature and a much more um, a different way of approaching things. And so I think that there is a lot to be learned from that. Whereas in workshop A, it was a little bit more of a, um, we are going to defend at all costs kind of thinking. And um, I'd say it's definitely an ongoing conversation to have about that. Yeah. I have a question. Okay, so kind of about the survey. I was wondering um, if there was a correlation between the countries and places that had little response or didn't have a lot of climate actions towards sea level rise that um, also responded uh, that they don't find that there's like a or a space to build capacity. And then with that, I had something else. That first. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Um, so we did not find a statistical correlation between what would be considered a low-resourced country or a low-resourced region um, and whether or not they were doing sea level rise work. So even though I pointed out on the map the dichotomy between Northern Europe and Southern Europe and, Afri and Northern Africa or the dichotomy between the U.S. and the Caribbean, we didn't find statistically that there was a significant, there wasn't a statistical, statistically significant result there. Some of that is a relatively low N, and so again, I think a global sample might give us some pretty different results in regards to that. Okay, and then I remember my second part. Great. Um, from the workshop, did you see in the participants, like New Zealand people influencing people who didn't really have that really close connection between nature and their policies um, kind of be inspired to work harder on that? Um, you know, I, I'd say yes in a very simple sense that the subsequent follow-on workshop that's happening is fully hosted by New Zealand. And I think there was a really tremendous amount of interest in what New Zealand is doing, how they're doing it. Some of it relates back to that idea of dynamic adaptation pathways, which New Zealand at the national scale has mandated be happening at the local scale. Um, so there is definitely some real interest in what New Zealand is doing and how they are um, potentially a really good model for other places across the globe. Yeah, I see a question back there. Hi. Um, I was wondering, uh, in talking to practitioners, particularly after these workshops, were there particular limitations that they talked about or barriers that they were thinking about in implementing these recommendations? Um, it's a good question. I would say that there's a bunch of different barriers that people have identified. Um, I do think that one of the biggest one comes back to resources. I've heard in... I mean, there's numerous studies that suggest that as well, but that, you know, the resource of time, you know, practitioners, this is not the only thing on their list is sea level rise. Um, so that seems to be, I'd say, one of the biggest issues. And then um, conflicting demands. So not necessarily on their time, but I kind of comes back to the question of the demand for, well, we really need more development in our community because that's going to raise the economic base and the only place to put that development is over in that wetland location. 
Um, so I think that those are, I'd say, two of the biggest challenges that people were facing is um, you know, con conflicting philosophical needs. There's this near-term pressure to act and take certain things, not necessarily about sea level rise, but about you know, creating, creating an economic engine within their community versus these long-term risks. But uh, I just noticed that one of the areas that was no response was Central America. Um, and it seems like a really key place to have some sort of resiliency plan in place. And I just was wondering, I guess, if, if you know of anything that's going on with, with them, <laughs> what's going on in Central America, I guess. Um, you know, I think that... And actually, Addison spent some time not in Central America, but in South America, so you might be able to provide your own insight into that. Um, I would say that at least from a research design perspective, we had some places in the globe where we had better collaborators. Um, and I think our Central America, Latin America, our Central America, South America collaborator was, did an amazing job of giving us lots of names, but not necessarily an amazing job of giving us names of people who were the right people or who were definitely going to respond. So that's one answer to your question is that we just, I mean, just finding the people, like finding the local planners in all of these countries is really challenging. And I think that was one of our really big gaps. The other one, um, I presented this work at a conference in Singapore, and there was one person who did his Masters at Berkeley in landscape architecture who now works in Brazil. So this is sort of a, not a statistic sample at all, but just sort of one particular person's set of stories. And he said in Brazil, nobody's doing this. Sea level rise work is not happening in Brazil. So that's not to say, therefore, he knows everything. But I do suspect that there's probably a combination that the reason it was hard to find names is that there might not have been a lot of people who are doing this work. Um, we sort of we started with an understanding that we were looking for people we thought might be doing the work. So, I think those two things give a little bit of a clue. Um, but I would say it's anyone who's interested. I mean, that is a part of the globe that clearly we had the least response from, both in terms of workshop participation and the survey. So, um, a lot more digging could be done in that place. Okay, um, so kind of to go along with Alana's and Mary Claire's question, um, so since um, climate change affects lower income brackets so much more, um, how, I guess, did you incentivize or would you in the future people of those lower income brackets to um, respond to those surveys? Um, that's a really good question. Um, I would say that, well, I guess there's two... Two pieces to that, right? So I'm, I wasn't directly working with, um, with the low income brackets in the sense that I'm working with people who are of the professional realm. Um, you know, that said, clearly, even at that realm, right, getting somebody from a professional place in Southeast Asia is, was harder than getting somebody from Philly, like just sort of to generalize, which is not to, um, you know, and so I, I do think that when you think about incentivizing, I actually think that these workshops were a relatively easy dip your toe in entry point in a way to make it somewhat accessible um, because it wasn't, we intentionally made it two hours a day so it didn't consume all of their work day. They could stay in their job settings. It was all online. The, in, the whole event itself was free. Um, I think that in terms of engaging more professionals, I'd say, um, credentialing is probably one way to really incentivize further. So it could be part of a training program or something that they could um, get permission from their boss to get paid time as opposed to something extra and added onto their schedule. I think that's probably one way from at the professional level. The question then of if you're a planner or you're a landscape architect or you're working in a place and how do you get, you want to hear from the African American community in parts of New Orleans and you know, how do you get them to come and participate? I think that one of the things there is really actually going to them, um, going out into the community and finding the key players in those communities is gonna be a really big way. So it's, you, know, you start with sort of 
um, I've been working on this project here in Utah, and there's an organization called Heal Utah that I've been um, introduced to that does, that does exactly this kind of work around health and equity. In, um, they, they're working mostly in the west side of Salt Lake City and in the um, Municipal Services District in Kearns and Magna. So finding those partners um, and then relying on those partners too. I think sometimes, um, I mean, not to say that I can't speak to people of different races and origins and backgrounds, but sometimes finding the right people and the right players and really going to where, where the community that you want to talk to is. All right, those have been some great questions. Do we have one more maybe? <laughs> or we can head on up to the common studio. All right, cool. Well, thank you so much, Daniela. Thank <laughs> you.